Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, may I thank you for your kind invitation to the Society of Antiquaries of London. I'm really honored. And uh, I'm honored even more so that my very modest report is of interest uh, from such knowledgeable audience. Uh, I would like to present a short survey of the English silver from the 16th up to the 20th century from the Kremlin Armory Museum. So, this is the building of the Kremlin Museum. You can admire it, which was built in 1851 by Konstantin Ton, architect. The Kremlin Armory Museum in Moscow is a unique museum in prison in possession of extraordinary riches containing the surviving treasures of the Tsars created by Russian masters, uh, Russian craftsmen, as well as outstanding works of art from Western Europe and uh, those of Oriental origin. They were either bought as uh, diplomatic gifts or purchased for the Tsars treasury by specially appointed agents. The armory contains the only in the world collection of ambassadorial gifts of the 16th and 17th centuries from England, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Poland, and Austria. And this is a showcase in the Armory Kremlin Museum, in so called the Hall of West European Silver, or diplomatic gifts, with a collection of late Tudor and early Stuart silver. The museum now has an escaping of 500 pieces of English silver, of which 115 made between 1557 and 1663. It would be quite interesting to mention that this collection is one of the biggest and the most important of the period in the world. Actually, the earliest part of the collection is well known due to publications and exhibitions. I mean, first of all, the catalog of the English silver of the 16th and 17th centuries, written by Madame Tamara Goldberg. It was published in Russian in 1954. The famous book by Charles Ullman, uh, The English Silver in the Kremlin, which was published in London in 1961, and catalogs of the exhibitions. In 1991, at uh, Sotheby's, in uh, 2006, at Yale Center for British Art in New Haven, in the same year at the Somerset House, and it is exciting that 20 pieces are being exposed in the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum now, the exhibition of treasures of the royal courts, Tudor, Stuart, and Tudor, Stuarts, and the Russian Tsars. Uh, six of these pieces have been recently attributed uh, by Dr. David Mitchell, who is among us, and uh, I would like to uh, thank him with all my heart. Uh, surviving documents testify to significant imports of silver pieces. Gifts and purchases entering the Kremlin were transformed to the Court of Exquire, Exchequer, I'm sorry, uh, where they were carefully weighed and recorded in special inventories. Here is the flask dated uh, 1663 and on the bottom there is the inscription. As on many objects the old Slavonic letters signifying the weight were engraved and sometimes also inscriptions indicating the source of the gift and the date of import. This flask was given as a diplomatic gift from the uh, from Charles II to Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich by embassy of Sir Charles Howard of Carlisle in 1664. One can identify existing objects with concrete embassies only from 1604, when the carriage that was a gift from James I to Tsar Boris Godunov arrived in Moscow. James I sent a variety of silver vessels in 1615, among them, there were 11 cups, the basin and ewer, flasks, pairs of livery pots, and a brazier like a deep pan with an open work, lead, and wooden handles. 
In 1620, John Merrick brought items from James I that were not entirely the standard English royal 17th century gifts, since they included not only silver plate and textiles, but also items of smith precious stones, as well as silver sculpture. Nor was the order in which the silver was presented the usual one. Cups were presented not first, among them one uh, which is exposed at the exhibition at the v in the Vindam Museum, this one, uh, which was made in 1613 by Thomas Cheston, attribution by Dr. David Mitchell. So, there were, um, these cups were presented uh, after a crystal salt, a jasper cup in a gold mount, the table sculptures of an unicorn, lion, and ostrich. In 1636, the diplomatic gifts were sent by Charles I via the agent Simon Digby. They included a pair of good cups, pairs of livery pots, flasks chased in the manner of shells, candlesticks, a lavabo set decorated with beasts of the sea, and one of them flask dated uh, 1606 and defied Maker GC. Of special interest were the gifts brought from Charles II by such as Calais Embassy of 1664. Very significant commemorative pieces. A gun that had belonged to Charles I, French UN basin that was a part of dowry of Charles II's mother, Andretta Maria, were included in a quite ordinary set of diplomatic gifts. I mean, pairs of cups, livery pots, flasks, and candlesticks. Some new and fashioned pieces, as six fruit dishes and one unique piece, a perfume burner, were added. It is very important to realize the fact that the diplomatic gifts often were chosen among the silver pieces from the royal treasury, the jewel house. A pair of flasks dated to 1580-81 and the Warwick cup are decorated with the king's coat of arms. The Warwick cup decorated also with the device of the city of Warwick would seem to be one of the two surviving gifts among those given to James I in 1617 during his traditional tour of his lands. Some valuable pieces by English silversmiths entered the Tsar's treasury not from England directly, but from other countries. Among them, two livery pots and a basin. This is a basin sent by the King of Denmark, Christian IV, to Tsar Mikhail Romanov in 1622, and an English good-shaped cup of, eight, of 1589, given by the States General of Holland to Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich in 1648. Amongst the other species, the phone-shaped cup of 1557 is of exceptional interest. Cups of this type, in form reminding that of an Italian tazza, but differing having a broad and the sea stem, were widespread in England during the first half of the 16th century. The latest examples date back to the 1570s. Traditionally, such vessels were to be found in local parish churches, where they were used as chalices. They were found today in churches in Kent, Oxford, and Leicestershire. During the second half of the 16th century, it became fashionable to adorn vessels of this form with Renaissance motifs, bustling figures in antique armor and emblems in the medallions at the center of the bow. In Russia and in the countries of Northern Europe, it was used not for drinking but for the serving of fruits and other dainties. Many pieces made in the second half of the 16th century were decorated with engravings, such as a livery pot dating from 1594, covered with finely engraved, elegant, grotesque spiral tendrils, heads of fantastical beasts and birds, large palmets and shells. This ornament, consisting of a complex combination of grotesques, was developed by the engraver Nicholas Russell, who arrived in England from Flanders in 1563. There are nine liver pots in the armory dating from the period 1585 to 1663. All of them are Hansekana, or pots of Hansa type. The name Hansekana appeared in English documents of 1526 
under the inventory of the royal Tudor plate complied in 1574. The livery part of 1613-14 is a splendid example of early Stuart silver, chased with the images of Neptune and Tritons and Dolphins, the heads and winged cupids beneath bal baldachins, winged sirens with fish tails and coat of arms and shells. The representation of dragonly winged sirens' faces among the grotesques on the body of this piece, as well as horn-blowing tritons, shows evident influence of Netherlands Dutch ornamental sources. Indeed, the tritons are very similar to Andrian colors, Aaron with a lyre and dolphin. The armory owns a very rich collection of English standing caps. Cups traditionally occupied an important place amongst ambassadorial gifts, and indeed usually featured at the hand of the list of gifts. Large gilded cups with covers up to 90 centimeters high were specially chosen or made as gifts. This is one of the examples. Two other standing cups are decorated with images of beasts. The manner of execution and treatment of hunting or subjects on one of these are of markedly English national character. Indeed, unlike the classically idealized hunting sense of Germans on German silver, English silver work is dominated by a desire for realistic action and naturalistic depictions of animals. Animation and a more personal, emotional expression is achieved through the unexpected introduction of somewhat naive details, such as the frog seated on a dragon. Among the extremely rare pieces in the armory are heraldic cups, decorated with lions, unicorns, and griffons. One is decorated with a typical English heraldic symbol, a stridica pinnacus, a composite beast, part dragon, part lion, amidst heavenly orange trees. The other, as you can see, with figures of lion and unicorn. The armory collection also has two examples of steeple caps, whose globule or thistle-shaped form was almost exclusively the product of English silversmiths, although it was a shape popular in Portugal too. There is a group of cups whose forms were borrowed from German silver. Yet while bell-shaped and great cups directly repeat the shapes of German prototypes, the good-shaped cups are clear examples of local masters applying a natural interpretation to a form introduced from elsewhere. In the armory, two different types of good cup are represented, each having a distinct scheme of decoration. A standing cup of 1589, which was sent by General States of Holland, is decorated with typical English flat chased ornament of quadrifolds and multi petal trousers in ovals and circles linked by strap work. Another cup of a similar form employs motifs characteristic of Netherlands ornament, the sirens and tendrils ending in dolphin's heads of the kind widespread in, for instance, the Prince of Theodore de Bray and Marcus Geertz. Still another characteristic English vessel that became popular in the Renaissance is the flask, commonly called the pilgrim bottle because it carried by pilgrims on their way to the Holy Land. Six large flasks dating from between 1580 and 1563, measuring anything from 44 to 50 centimeters and decently decorated are today in the armory. Four of these rare vessels are now exposing at the Victoria and Albert Exposition. Exhibition. They are extremely impressive objects and were thus highly suitable for use as diplomatic gifts, usually being produced in pairs. Its popularity continued right up to the 19th century. In addition to the font-shaped thistle cups and flasks, English silversmiths in late Tudor and early Stuart times produced another characteristic vessel in the large standing salt. This square salt seems to be a symbol of Elizabethan culture. Here the features of many different kinds of art, prints and drawings, wood carving, textiles and even literature and the theatre were woven in a single whole. Elements of Netherlandish ornament and the engraving, these nails on the suspending draperies, 
the proportions of the figures resonant with English wood carving, the hunting scenes so widespread on tapestries, the depictions of gods that recall the costumes, the costumed characters that appeared in 16th century pageants, such rich iconography contributes to the spectacular effect. Particular mention must be made of a group of unique items, among them two pairs of large water pots dating from 1604 and 1615, and a pair of huge leopards that have become to symbolize uh, the Moscow collection. United by the common provenance, each of these outstanding examples of English silverwork once formed part of the English royal treasury known as the Jewel House, and is described in the list of plate forming the great gilt cupboard of estate sold to the royal jeweler John Acton in 1626. Both pairs of water pots and the leopards were brought to Russia by the agent of the Moscovy company Fabian Smith, known in Russian documents as Fabian Ulyano, for Tsar Mikhail Romanov in 1629. Such water pots have no analogies in any other collection of English silver, either in terms of their notable height, 64 <coughs> centimeters, or their ornamentation. Both share common features, identical form deriving from ceramics, spout in the form of a dragon's head with wings spread, and complex handles in the form of a snake curled in, into a ring and with jaws stretched wide. The nature of, an, of the ornamentation differs, however. The water pots of the 1604 on the left are notable for their combination of English ornament consisting of two de roses and thistles with the tongues of flame typical of Hispano-Portuguese silver. The German, the German ornamental tradition, with its sense of dramatic tension, the pulsating and somewhat nervous treatment of form, its interest in plastic effects, is felt in the sirenes with widespread wings and the abundance of cast details, for example, lizards, as well as the overall density of decoration on the water pot of 1615. Amongst the 17th century English silver in the armory is a group of works in Baroque style, including cups, livery pots, fruit dishes, a flask, and a perfume burner, all made in 1663 and brought as gifts for Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich by the embassy of Charles Howard, Earl Carlisle from Charles II, which arrived in Russia in 1664. All of them, with the sole exception of the perfume burner, are decorated in floral style. The perfume burner, described in the original records as curiously enchaste and gilt, is a unique piece. It makes magnificent use of regular style, with combination with purse decoration, of course. This type of decoration, I mean auricular style, became part of the English silversmith vocabulary during the middle of the 17th century. It was Dutch master Christian van Vianen, employed at the court of Charles I, who was responsible for introducing the auricular style into English silver. In 1650, he published Medallis Artificial gratings based on his own works and those of his father, Adam van Vianen, showing all kinds of silver plate in the auricular style. Uh, now I um, would like to draw your attention uh, to an almost unknown part of the collection, that is the English silver of the 18th, 20th centuries. The collection of the English silver of the 18th, 20th centuries consists of more than 400 pieces and mainly contains the items by London masters, which is the vast majority, as well as the pieces by uh, the silversmiths from Birmingham and Sheffield. Of the mentioned group, only 28 date back to the 1700s. Others were made in the period from the 19th up to the 20th centuries, and most of them are examples of flatware. In the 19th century, the collection of the museum was replenished from different sources, including private collections. Early in the 1920s, 
silver tables and chandeliers of great artistic value were given over to the museum from the repository of the great Kremlin Palace. At about the same time, English silver from the Patriarch's High Priest's treasury enriched the museum collection. The museum foundation, which gathered valuable pieces of art from private collections, monasteries, churches, and museums, was set up after the revolution. As of 1920, silver pieces were given over to the armory from different state organizations. Some pieces were bought and are continued to be bought from private collectors nowadays. Unfortunately, during the 1930s, some pieces were sold. Three chandeliers and a table by Paul de Lamery were chosen for selling in 1930. But they returned to the Armory Museum from a special organization aimed at selling pieces of art. They returned to the museum in 1933 due to dedication and enormous efforts of the director of the museum, Dmitry Ivanov, who managed to achieve it by never-ending demands and appeals. Of the numerous number of English silver of 18th to early 20th centuries, only several were published. Two of them were published, I mean uh, saying, speaking about these two, a table by Augustus Courtauld and one of the chandeliers by Paul de Lamery. These two were published by uh, Alfred Jones in uh, um, 1909 in the old English plate of the Imperial of Russia, published in London. One chandelier was published uh, in the catalogue of uh, Paul de Lamery's exhibition, which was uh, um, at the Goffman's Hall in 1989. And four pieces in the Sotheby's exhibition catalogue in 1991. The majority of them will be published for the first time in the catalogue Rizina this year. Among the 18th century silver, the earliest is a jug dating to 1707 by Richard Green. It is a vivid example of Queen Anne's style, the poor English perception of art which tends to modest decor and simplicity of form is certainly reflected in the silver of the period. Very often only heraldic engraving is used as decoration, as is in the case where the body and lead are decorated with engraved coat of arms of two Irish families, Moore and Co. Quite rare pieces of English silver are the tables and chandeliers. Tables dating to 1720s and 1742, as well as chandeliers of 1724 and 1734, are fantastic works of art by great masters of the 18th century, Paul de Lamer and August, Augustine Courtauld. So here is the table made by Paul de, Lam Paul de Lamer. The tables are decorated with engraved masks, shells, and diaper work. On the left, this is a tabletop of Paul de Lamery's table, and on the right, tabletop of table made by Augustine Courtauld. The engraved cartouches and ornamented friezes of the intricatonant with bust medallions are very typical of Paul de Lamere's early period of the 1720s. The decoration of the silver from the Trabitulis service from the collection of the Schmalen Museum in Oxford can be regarded as an example. A similar male mask is found, is found on the Wolpel silver from the Victorian Delbert collection. The graphic sources of the engraved images date back to Daniel Moreau. The sizes of the table top, I mean called the Lamerous table, 70 to 53, match the sizes of tea trays of the 1720s, 1730s. It is supposed that a monumental tray from the workshop of Paul de Lamery was about one decade later turned into a table. Its decor was enriched by engraved motifs along the perimeter and on the place along the edges. This assumption is based on different stylistic peculiarities of ornaments. 
still another proof is that the maker's mark, Paul Glamour's mark, was later covered by the engraved ornament. The table by Augustus Curtold is under conservation now. And um, are they able to? I can show you only its table top, which has been recently cleaned. It's impressed by its masterly work, which is shown mainly in the mimical variety of depicted personalities. Unfortunately, it's hard to see, but we'll try. So, in the mimical variety of depicted personalities, satires, young women, and a bearded old man. The effect of plasticity, of plasticity is very typical of the graphic works by William Hoggart. The pieces by Paul Delamery, among them seven chandeliers kept in the armory, of which two are one tier six cones, one is one tier sixteen cones, and four two tier sixteen cones, stand out by their massive size and monumentality. Excuse me, please, for producing old photos. Unfortunately, the chandeliers are dismantled at present, but I do believe that they will be exposed um, in the new museum building, in the new mu uh, building of the museum in future. The presence of the crown with angels and the motto Gloria Deo in Excelsis on the one tier chandeliers allowed to assume that they were commissioned by Nicholas Leake, the fourth Earl of Scarsdale, to decorate one of his luxurious mansions. The last Earl of Scarsdale passed away in 1736, being bankrupt, and his property, including the chandeliers, was sold. The seven chandeliers kept in the armory were acquired for the Empress Anne. It is known that four of them the two tier 16 ones were assembled in the facetic chamber before the coronation of Alexander III in 1881. The rest were kept in Verkhospaski Cathedral of the Grand Kremlin Palace. From 1926 till 1986, the chandeliers by Paul Delanery decorated the interiors of the Armory Museum. The works of other Huguenot masters, a coffee pot by Nicholas Premont, a cream pot by uh, George Campar, and a toilet box by Mivador, are the rare examples of Rococo, English Rococo silver in the possession of the Kremlin collection. Among them, the coffee pot by Nicholas Premont undoubtedly stands out. It belonged to the Russian imperial family from the middle of the 18th century, having entered the Winter Palace collection from the Arunenbaum Palace in the suburb of St. Petersburg in 1792 and becoming part of the armory collection in 1920s from the palace, I mean Winter Palace, property. It was part of the Arunenbaum service of, of which some items were made in the Chinoiserie style and seven of them are still in the Hermitage. The coffee pot is a rare work of one of the most talented silversmiths of his time, who made his silver in a very short time, spanned between 1743 and 1747. Precious and natural motives, dynamics of form and decor, virtuoso treatment of silver and wood make the coffee pot an outstanding rococo silver. In the middle of the 18th century, alongside with Rococo style, other tandas as a silver can be traced. They are connected with the neoclassic style. These trends are reflected in the aesthetics of marvelously polished, thickly gilded, and very smooth service of an ink of 1739 by Augustine Coutel. The neoclassic period in England in 1760 up to 1820 is quite possible to divide into two stages. The first is connected with the work of Paul Adam on the one hand and the powerful influence of the French silversmiths on the other. The examples of such works in silver are certainly the candlesticks from the Tula set of 1776-77. 
the precise plasticity of form, specific features of the canthus ornament, tend the introduction of the laurel frieze into the core of the candlesticks, produce evidence that Thomas Hemming, who made them, was dedicated to the style of Robert Adam. The armory chamber also has in its possession some pieces from the Tula, Valin, Tver, and the Yaroslavl sets made by the English silversmiths. In general, different sets were commissioned by Catherine the Great in London, Paris, and Augsburg as gifts to Russian provinces ruled by a governor general and known as governor general sets. The mentioned four, Tula, Valin, Tver, and the other slab sets, contained pieces made by Robert Jones I, John Scofield, William Chorner I, and George Hemming. Most of them are the Hermitage. After the death of the Empress in 1797, all sets were given over to the Winter Palace property, then some of them, for example, Tula Candlestick, Candlestick from a Tula set, was given to the Armour Museum. The representatives of the later stage of neoclassic style were inspired not only by the Greek but also by Egyptian sources and are known as inheritance of the region style. The three plates and the salt cellar made by Dick Biscott and Benjamin Smith II from the site of 1804, which 12 years later was decorated with a memorial inscription commemorating George IV's visit to Berlin, are made in this style. In the armory, among the numerous everyday life items such as boxes, salt cellars, trays, plates, flatware, pertaining to different uh, historic styles, there were masterpieces of a memorial character commissioned by Russian emperors, Danish and English kings. Among them, two pairs of dessert stands of 1847, as well as a pair of flasks, 19. 1891 and the two-handled cup of 1902. The dessert stands originate from the famous London set ordered by Nicholas I after his return from London in 1844 and were made by the masters of Hunt and Rascal Farm. It also contains several, seven sculptural groups which were complete replicas of, of memorial objects made by masters of the famous firms Gerard and Company, Mortimer and Hunt, Hunt and Rascal. Some of them are in the Hermitage. In Russia, this celebrated set was supplemented by work produced by the St. Petersburg firms of Pavel Sizikov and Nicholas and Plinke, as well as the Imperial Glass Factory. The crystal vases and silver frames were included in this set. Altogether, some 1,600 80 items were made for the London set during the period from 1844 to 1848. The works of Hunt and are famous for the thorough execution of tiny details and overall plastic effect of the casting, which are evident especially in the cast foliage of these vines and the meticulously rounded fur of the animals. The dessert stands are particularly interesting, being rare samples of such decorations in the 19th century, dating back to the German Konfektbaum of the 17th century, and we have in the A pair of flasks and a two-handled cup belong to Gerrit and Company, which without a famous firm hunting rascal greatly contributed to the English silver in the 19th century. A pair of flasks of quite an impressive size 79 centimeters high, with an engraved inscription, a good example of tradition. We know, from the we know from the inscription that it was given by the King of Denmark, Christian IX, as a, as a silver wedding gift to the Emperor Alexander III and Empress of Russia, Maria Fyodorovna Dagmar of Denmark. In the decor of these impressive vessels, the features introduced by Huguenot masters of the last quarter of the 17th century can be clearly seen. It is undoubtedly the use of cast details as Bacchus masks. The flasks are made in the Queen Anne style, while the two-handled cup is an exact copy of the similar one of 1740. Its design is based on that of several identical mid 
18th century London made cups, one of which bearing the maker's mark of Thomas Farr in 1740 belongs to the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths. This two-handled cup made in the workshops of Charles Stuart Harris in 1902, retailed by Garrett and Company, was given to the Grand Duke Alexei Nikolaevich on, his, on the day of his baptizing from his efficient great-uncle and godfather, King Edward VII. The workers of masters from local centers in the collection of the armory allowed to judge their peculiarities and specialization. From 1860, the English firms began to specialize in making miniature silver. The fashion for miniature silver was revived in the 20th century and became extremely fashionable in the times of Edwards. In Birmingham, miniature silver was produced in such great volumes that it was exported to Holland. Many pieces of the toys, coffee, and tea set of 1905-08 were made by masters of Saunders and Shefford, a renowned firm which has been in Birmingham since its uh, foundation in 1869. Their size is from 2 centimeters up to 13. All these pieces are kept in the red velvet box with the Russian state coat of arms on its lid and belong to the Russian imperial family, entered the armory in 1914 from the palace in Crimea, Levadia. Numerous examples of lightware made between 1920 and 1940 by well-known English firms such as Garrett Company, Goldsmiths and Silversmiths Company, Holden, Altwinkle, and Slater are kept in the armory. The majority of... Uh, I would like to show once again the showcase. But I didn't succeed. This one. Yes. It's nice to look in general, the majority of pieces from the armory are fantastic examples of the craftsmanship of English silversmiths and provide a brilliant overview of the most important features of the world-famous collection. It is incomparable not only due to the number of unique pieces, which is true to the earliest part of the collection of the late Tudor and earliest Stuart silver, but also due to its variety. Having been in the Kremlin for many centuries, beginning from the middle of 1500s, and in spite of different historical turbulences, the English silver is very well preserved in its, in its original aspect, as it has never been polished or regilded. From the very beginning, the collection has been treasured and kept with the utmost care and respect. That is about all what I wanted to bring to your attention today. Thank you very much. <laughs>